So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 A couple of them. Uh, yeah. G actually still still had a whole slew of them for a while. Uh, so just because it's ending support doesn't mean you're not going to still stumble across a lot of it. I can I can imagine a lot of it. Oh, wait, yeah, it's out there. Yeah, it's gonna wait. People are afraid to migrate. Yeah. Well, it's a yeah, it's different too. I mean. Yeah. Oh, this is uh, uh, past marathon. This is 24 hours of oh. SQL. I think most of this is, yeah, it's an online uh, event, but there's pretty much uh, something going every hour uh, oh, next cool. month, actually. So, I, yeah, definitely some interesting topics. They should have uh, a list of what is going to be covered out for that already. Redgate sponsor stuff usually pretty good, too. Yeah. On and trivia. There we go. Here, here is your yes. This is the special summit code. Um, this is our chapter discount code. So if you use the code, one, it'll get you one hundred fifty dollars off the summit uh, tickets themselves. Two, some of that money was going to come back to our local club organization here and oh, that's cool. help support us for the year. Yeah, it used to be that the summit would move between cities. A long time ago. That was, that was before my time. Yeah, yeah I've gone in when it was in Dallas. I mean, they still have, they've got SQL Saturdays all over. I know, but yeah. 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 But Or the uh, the SQL Cruise. Right? What? <laughs> There's a SQL Cruise? Yes. yes. Every year they oh, try to do fun. one SQL Cruise, and they during the day, it's eight hours of sessions with some of the top Microsoft SQL people in, in the world. And then at night, your your ship makes a port of call somewhere. And uh, two years ago, it was the Caribbean. And then last year, it was Alaska. I don't know what's lined up for this year for it. Um, Kuwait? Budget. If it's something you're interested in, um, you can ping me afterwards, and I can dig up the information and send you to you in an email. Could you, back to, could you go back to the code real quick? Sure. Yeah, you might have the summer off, or you might have September off. Yep. It was in October. Okay. Well, I was trying to hook up with Jess because she's supposed to be doing some stuff, but I haven't heard back from her. Just had to help me out with that. So. It's actually out on that today on that site, and they have this really nice cheat letter to convince your boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Actually, yeah. the right. boss is like, "Well, yeah, send Thanks, me Adam. a proposal." I'm like, uh, "Okay." <laughs> it's all done for me. Here it is. That's awesome. <laughs> Good. Uh, and now we have uh, upcoming webinars. Um, I think the global Chinese might not be super useful, but uh, <laughs> the rest of them are all very applicable. I actually did a ton of work for GE and a bunch of Chinese sites, and they have uh, like Rackspace type thing going on over there with a couple of areas mm. and they had them install like this was a while ago and they had them install 10, 10 terabyte drive arrays so it was like 40 terabyte of zero <coughs> map uh, it was crazy fast stuff but the amount of data was astounding um, this these lists and the upcoming virtual webinars are all on the past page themselves, so you can always review those there. And if you okay. happen to Excellent. have some downtime, depending on where they're going down, they might, might be able to catch them. In each of the virtual groups, sure. That's pretty nice. That, I think, is just amazing. And then, yeah, there's a, if you go to the past page, there are hundreds of virtual groups out there. Upcoming SQL Saturdays in, oh, do we not have any in the US listed at the moment? Okay, that one's off. Dallas, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Sorry. Philadelphia, Phoenix, nothing nearby. <laughs> well, US. And yeah, so that brings us, so we have just a few more minutes. Um, if any, uh, we do like to take a, a minute or two in case anyone knows of their company is hiring and looking, or if they themselves are aware of any uh, database, SQL, or BI people who are available at the moment. Televent's always hiring. Yes, Televent, the company me and Tom works for. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm looking. I don't know. You know, if you could put me in touch with somebody. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Send That'd be me helpful. your resume. D O C L A N E at Gmail. I mean, it's going to be a, uh, when you start your uh, slide deck, it'll be on the first slide too long. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I have my telemont one there. I just thought that one was easier to say. D O C. Doc Lane. Oh. Doc Lane at Gmail. <laughs> it's an easy one to remember. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. Did you did you broadcast that one? Oh yeah, there you go. Broadcasting. How do you spell Telegram? T A L A V A N T. Telegram. A lot of A's. What does the company do? We are all <coughs> consulting, mostly Microsoft um, VI yes. tech. Oh, okay. Cool. But we are branching, so if you know any other technologies, don't be afraid. Yeah, I did a lot of Unix, Linux stuff, and um, been involved with Oracle. And actually, I was looking we at we Postgres. We don't like Oracle, so get the heck out of here. <laughs> well, <laughs> Postgres, well, Postgres is object-oriented, so it's yeah. actually kind of neat. And then there's, you know, obviously, they bought MySQL up, and so MariaDB is out there. And it actually does file-compatible Oracle mounts. So I could take Oracle file-based, uh, you know, file uh, database, um, basically do the same thing that you do with our man, just uh, restore them, and um, your Oracle data is on a MariaDB uh, NX database. It's really kind of slick. So um, I'm going to talk about um, temporal tables, but my abstract's a little bit, you know, aggressive, and I might not get that aggressive. So um, I said I would get to you know, data warehousing stuff. I think it's a little aggressive, so I'm going to go through. Actually, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the types of um, ways of tracking changes within SQL Server. So the three methods that are available. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll settle on a temporal tables at the end, so which is one of the three. Okay, um, so just so you don't expect to get into something, you know, I'm not going to get to because that was a little aggressive. Probably need to change my my abstract a bit or try to tighten it up a little bit. But um, I have my PhD in inorganic chemistry. I obtained it in 1993 from UW Milwaukee. Um, I made things like like that. That's what I made. Okay. Um, so those are um, ligand bridge bimetallic compounds. So that's a tungsten. That's a tungsten. That's a ligand in the middle. That's, uh, and that ligand is a diisocyanide. So one four diisocyanide. Um, and that's and that's one. Uh, Fun thing to make right here, you use phosgene gas, which is basically what they used during the First World War to kill millions of people. Yes. So you use, <laughs> you use phosgene gas inside a nice little um, vented hood, and basically it's a gas, so you condense it to measure it, and then you, you spend it into a little drop at a time into your glass. You then um, go ahead and um, wait for it to react. But if you smell wet hay while you're doing that, don't breathe anymore. You're basically dead. That's so. <laughs> too late. <laughs> so uh, that that's what I did for a lot of my life. So if I die early, I know why. So that's really good. Besides all the other things I have in my body, my knee and my hip. But um, I did a postdoc at Marquette, and I was just explaining the fact that um, I got told my postdoc was up after three years, like. Two and three days before it was up, so he just ran out of money. He said, "Oh, I didn't check." So here you go. You don't have any more money, so go find a job. So that's how I ended up in 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 this world is because I basically had been teaching at Marquette's Continuing Ed for a long time, and before that to make extra money because you make a grand total of eighteen thousand dollars a year with a PhD and a postdoc. So. Don't don't think you make a lot of money. So I made extra money teaching classes and to continue net. That's how I got into um, IT essentially. 
but I didn't do, I didn't just do it as well. To get my PhD, I needed to do a lot of programming and stuff like that as well, kind of as a requirement. And so basically I found out that I need to know programming and all this IT stuff to become a chemist and make $35,000 a year. <laughs> or I could go into IT and make a lot more. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense that I'm required to know IT to get a less paid job. Really? I, mean, I thought I had a rough but You started off your career with bad gas. Yeah, I did. Really bad gas. Mm -hmm. um, my first real job in programming was at Tesla's Computer Services as a consultant. I did VB, Access, SQL Server, whatever I could do. And um, that's where I got my, my love of SQL Server is that right at the end, I kind of became the manager of their, their SQL Server instances. And so I loved it, and I liked the fact that it always had an answer. Unlike in chemistry, you never have an answer. So I stayed in, stayed in the computer world, because answers come. You just have a rotten smell in chemistry. Yeah, and, and you never get the right answer. Because one time you might spit into the flask and it works, and the next time you forget to spit and it doesn't work. So you never know. So, all right. So I've been in a lot of different roles. Um, the one I hated the most was this one. And that, that one I will hate forever. I never want to do that again. You don't do any work. You just do a lot of politics, and it's terrible. So if anyone's been a director of anything, you know that it's just a management nightmare. People are good. It's just the departments suck. So just my feeling on the thing, and that's now on camera. And everyone else <laughs> Nope, nope, did not, and I won't. But I've loved every other role, um, and I especially love working with SQL Server. Um, I work for Telemont, and this slide looks terrible on here. Um, but um, basically, we're an um, internet, or not internet, but a, um, a BI consulting firm. We basically try to minimize um, your footprint, your time, your and maximizing return on investment. We do have a lot of tricks and, and, and things that allow us to come in and create a data warehouse in a very quick turnaround fashion. Um, uh, there's one where you're using T4, um, BIML, and what else are we using? SSIS, of course, because that's BIML. And we basically can come in and analyze your database and create a data warehouse in maybe five days. So, not too bad. All the SSIS packages are there. Um, so, if anyone's looked at BIMAL, you'll wonder. It's a wonderful little tool for automating the creation of SSIS packages. All right. Um, so, we'll look at um, tracking changes within SQL Server databases. How do you track changes yourself? Are you guys do any of that? Anything? Nothing. Bunch of different ways. Yeah. Inline auditing, audit tables. Yeah. Turn Those on. are the ways that normally people have, have approached it, right? Is they create either they create a trigger on the table or they create some kind of other auditing feature or they make sure that they always use the store procedure in which they create something that maintains that. But you're never guaranteed that, you know, everyone altered the data that way or did it the right way. Um, CDC but Yep, and that's the options. And so back in, in 2008, in SQL Server, they introduced two new change tracking tools. And that was change data capture. And um, that was only enterprise. So that was wonderful, right? Because you know every company you work for had lots and lots of money. <laughs> right? Sorry. Right. And so they could afford enterprise, right? As long as they fired two DBAs. Right. No one could really <laughs> afford that. So they also put in place trains tracking, which is done at a more um, basic level. And that um, was available in all editions. Um, and that you can just put on, right? You can just turn that on anytime you have that available. Um, so change tracking is a lightweight, efficient tracking mechanism. It answers a couple of questions for you. It answers what records have changed and has the row changed. Basically, that's it. 
Does it give you information on how many times it changed? No, it doesn't. Does it give you information on what's changed? No. Or who changed it? Yeah, or who changed it? No. But it does track in a simple, simple method for getting out that a record has changed. So if you're looking at a data warehouse, you run it twice a, once a day, right? And all you want to do is load the changes. This is a very efficient way to say, hey, I just need to find out if a row has changed. That's all I need to know. I don't want to know all the changes in between because my company doesn't care about that, right? And so this is this can be a way to do that. All right. Um, great for one-way or two-way synchronization. Um, so basically, let me see my notes here. Um, so, and that's the only thing, if you want to do this, you get it from the last time you loaded and the last time you checked what has changed, okay? Um, so, you enable change tracking at the database level first, and then you say, okay, come on. And it's a simple just alter database, and you, you add how long you want to retain the changes, and that you want it to clean up or not. Okay, so keeping track and cleaning up the history. Okay, auto cleanup. Um, the actually old de de definition is retention period is specified as a numeric um, compound. Um, usually, I'm try trying to take a new technique for writing these slides, the Japanese method, which says don't put anything on the slides anymore. Remember that? So now it's not up here anymore. So I've taken it off, so it's in here. I don't like that, so I <laughs> can't remember what, what all the definitions are anymore. It's something about saying people don't like to read anymore. I don't know what it is. Sort attention spans? I don't know what it is. Why? Um, so um, basically the retention is in days, hours, or minutes, and you just specify days, hours, or minutes after that. Okay? All right. And I will go through some demos. And so change tracking, you enable it on each table. Okay. And then the way you do it is simply saying the table, enable change tracking, and with tracking columns. You can do the columns, but you'll, I'll, I'll go through it, but when you put in the columns and what's changed, it's a really tough one to figure out how, which columns change. It's really tough. So I wouldn't use that unless you know that you want to write a lot of queries to figure out what's changed. All right. So it's a little bit tough. Um, let's see. So the usage, I'm going to go through that and let's go through the demo. I need to change to Let me move to this. Is this the same slide? No. Yeah. So It's more comfortable for you to sit. You don't have to. Oh no! Up. Actually, it's it's right. terrible to sit and it's terrible to stand. So don't. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so it's working is, on levitation, but that's not. Yeah, know. yeah. It's just it just doesn't matter. Um, so um, first thing I'm going to do is just make sure I don't have any change tracking enabled. So I'm going to go ahead and just make sure I turn it all off. I'll probably get some errors. Yeah, good. So I don't have anything oh, yeah. enabled. Just to make sure there's no tricks up my sleeve. I haven't done anything. You didn't check before you tried to turn it off? <laughs> no, I did not. I would probably do a lot more if oh, I wasn't I doing this for a demo. Time. And I knew exactly. I what time. I yeah, this is, this is um, AdventureWorks database. This is actually my works database. No, I'm just kidding. We sell bicycles. So, <laughs> yeah. And we like to name our databases after the year they're created, which makes no sense. <laughs> All right. I love instances of the version that. of SQL Server that it's installed yeah, there. What has happened here? I want to update. So, um, what has happened here? 
I usually don't have the the results show up. Uh, this is weird that it's showing up today. Okay, so to enable it on the database, you simply go like so. So we're going to enable the change tracking now. And what that does is essentially says if I went in here and I went to properties, I would see that it's change tracking is enabled. Okay, can I do that here too? Yeah, yeah, but who likes to do that, right? We'll build a script for it. We gotta do a script, right? Come on. I was just talking about how much I hate PowerShell, so. <laughs> but no, it's like I think we went so far ahead, now we have to go back. Why is that? Why, 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 why? Okay, so I'm gonna enable it on the, the person dot person table and I'm going to enable uh, columns updated. And then in doing so, I will notice that this table is, let me, let me update this. I hope, no, wait a second. That's not good. I forgot to do so. Wait, don't look at anything. <laughs> Clean up my mess from testing today. Sorry. There. Now that looks better. Now there's there's no, no don't look at anything I just did. Don't look at any of that. Okay. That's for the next demo. Don't 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 get excited yet. Okay. So all we will notice that when we go down to the properties for that, we'll notice that change tracking is enabled for that table. That's simple. Okay. What we can look at is to see what the version, and that is how many iterations of changes and transactions has it been recording in, in changes so far, okay? So if I get that, I'm gonna get a number of nine, because I've been running this a couple of times, so there's been some versions that run in here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna change the name Tom to Thomas and Thomas to Tom. Just because I have no connection to the name Thomas, just seemed to be a name I want to choose. So, just, just there. Back. Okay, so I will just show you essentially what's in here. There's right now a few Toms and a lot of Thomases. Okay, if you want to look at the database before, there were a lot more Toms. I run this a couple of times, so it's been switching a number of times. All right, so. I then can just update them from one to the other. And now if I ran that again, you'll notice that the Toms have switched to Thomas's, or Tom, Thomas's have switched to Thomas, and that's how it works. Whatever, okay? It works really nice, okay? Um, so let's look to see what the the change version is right now. Now it's 11. Okay, so basically three things have happened since then, essentially. Okay, um, and if I go ahead and use what's called the change table to monitor my changes, that's what I use. And the, the syntax for the change table is simply the, um, the change table um, Tape name the, and this is more um, joining information, but this basically says we tell which, which table we're going to look at, and I'm going to go ahead and say, what are my changes in here? And here they are. And that's the version number that they were changed at. Okay. So that's all the information. If I want to specifically look at a version like this, I'm going to go one minus, because that way it'll show me all the data. Where is that going to? Oh, 
I'm oh, sorry. That's all I want to run is right there. Okay. Now, to look at the column properties, this is how I look to see what has changed, which columns have changed. And you can notice that this column property uses the change tracking column mask. You have to know the column that you're looking for. You have to write it in this special way. And by using this code, you get the information as to which columns have changed. So if I run this as well, darn it, I should have brought down that variable all the way down. the last one, right? So this tells me that the first name changed and we're using version 12, so that was the last one. So if version 12 changed, last name changed, the business entity number for what that change was, and this never gets saved, so this is not important. This um, change version, um, creation version actually has never been implemented, so it's always null. Okay, just so you're aware. This since 2008 it hasn't been implemented. No, it has not. Okay. So it's just not there, never will be. Don't know why it's there. And so basically that tells me on that last one that I did, it switched the first name on five of them. Okay. And that's all it says. And that and if you look at it, there's only five Toms or Thomases that are left. The other thing is we can, the minimum version number was nine. So we started at number nine, okay? So you would have to keep track of that version number, know where you are and make sure that you always get the version you're looking for um, and the max version that you're looking for. If you go for 12, you're only gonna get 12. If you do 11, you'll get all of them as well. And then remember that changes get wiped out. So that if you say retention of, ten, of two days, you return, if you don't run it in two days, you've missed some changes. Okay. So. Um, this will build agent jobs to. No, this one is done. And that's what I wanted to show you. I have that in here too. Thank you. Sorry. No, that's good. I, I wanted to show. I was hoping it was a good question. That was a good question. What's this? Triggers. This is how it does it. Okay. It maintains the history this way. And so it's very easy to understand. Just go ahead and use this anytime you want to do this. No. Just let let SQL Server do this for you. Please, please do. It. Yeah, don't don't do it yourself. But it manages it through a trigger that it produces. Okay. And what else do I want to see? Was it on that? All right. So the next one so, that we have to deal with is change data capture. Do you know? Uh, that's a weird slide. I had a question. Go ahead. Do you know if these are both supported in the current product too? Or? Yeah, all this is supported in, in all the versions right now from 2008 on. Okay. Change tracking is pretty easy to do. I would, if if you had nothing else you could do. I would, I would put it on just to see if you can identify changes. If that's all you're interested in, change tracking is a really simple piece to put in. It does have a, an impact on performance and it can have an impact on performance. It is synchronous, meaning it, if a transaction runs, that has to run as well to maintain that change table for you. So that is important to consider. If it's a large amount of changes that are taking place a lot, and it has to be timely. It may not be efficient for you. 
Okay, so synchronous, think of that, meaning every transaction you do, it also has to do its work. So it's at least double by. Uh, yeah, somewhat, or if not more, because yeah, it, it's I'm maintaining, least, right, yeah, yeah. So. it may be more. But if it's a small number, like a reference data that doesn't change very often, but you just want to track it, not, not hard to put, implement. Now, change data capture works a little bit different. You got your source table, any changes that happen obviously go into the log, right? That's how SQL Server works. The log maintains your changes, and the log has to be consistent and atomic, right? Has to be. That, that is the reason for the log, is to maintain that, that the assets there and it's going the right way, right? Okay, um, these changes are processed and then are, are logged to a change table and then you run change data capture functions to query that data. Okay. So very similar to replication. Yeah, it has a very similar um, footprint to transactional replication. All right. I don't know what that other drawing was there for, but it looked really <laughs> nice, huh? What was, that? Cool. what was that over there? That, that's a database with a file in it. I don't know what the heck that was there for. I, I maybe should have looked at this slide before I put it out there. Okay. Right. Um, change data capture. All the changes are tracked by storing the changes in a change table. Okay. Inserts. Insert one record into that change table. The delete show the values of each column prior to the delete. And that's what it tracks. So it's one record gets put in. When you update, what's an update really? It's kind of like a delete and then an, a, insert, an, an insert. So that's essentially what it's doing here. It's keeping track of what you changed and then, and then what does it change to. Okay, tracking all changes. Um, the way you implement this, um, and this is important, you must be a sysadmin to do this. And that means, or you must be a DBO. So part of the DBO group. So not just anyone should be able to implement this. It's not something that everyone should implement. Um, this is asynchronous though, like because it reads the log file. So it's not dependent upon anything but the log file. And because it reads the log file, it has very low impact on your on your production. So Does it, what level of Logging does it require full? No, you don't have to do anything. You have to worry about that. Just like in transactional replication, you don't have to have full. You know that makes people think that you have to keep the log. That has nothing to do with that. The log gets maintained. It reads the log whether it's full, simple, or bulk. What's it? Bulk insert is the other option. Right. So it doesn't matter on that. And. Transactional replication the same way. People often get that confused and say, hey, I have to put this at full, and then you end up with this, they don't take care of the log file and end up with this huge log file. And you go, why'd you do that? Because I have transactional replication. I have to have the transaction log going. No, 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 no don't. Don't do that. Don't get that confused, okay? Um, so they implement that, uh, you enable it at the DB, and then on each table, all right? The, um, the first, uh, the LSNs to get, you use LSNs, so that's a log sequential number, okay? So this is really tied to the LSNs. So you have to keep track of that. So that's the way you manage when you last ran, is you look to see what the max or the min LSN is to get where you're done so that you know that you're done for that day or whatever you're looking for changes. So you track that. So usually when you're doing a data load with a change data capture, you have something that tracks that LSN for you. So you know where you left off and where you're gonna pick up, okay? So to get the max LSN and the changes, you do that. To get changes, you get it with this function. It's a system function that is on every database that you enable change data capture. It might actually be there even by default. If you have, you may find it there. I don't know if it actually throws it in after 
after you enable it or if it's always there. Um, but you get all changes, and then this is the fun thing about it. You have to include in the, oh, it doesn't create it, that's right. This has to be created as you create it, that's right. It uses the skeleton and then it just builds it this way. For each right. table. So for each table, it creates one of these. Okay, sorry, didn't even look ahead. That's all I could see. <laughs> um, so you begin with the LSN and the end LSN. So what you would have to do is go in and say, hey, I ran this, I know what the max LSN I ran last time. Let me use that as my begin. And then where I am at right now, I'm checking to see what the max LSN is in there, and I run to that. So that means if things are happening at the same time, you might want to just say, well, I just picked this, and that's the, that's the place I go, all right? And just go to that spot. And then you can get all the changes, and you can get all that information out that way. So let's do the demo on the change data capture. I'm old, I just made a sound when I sat down. That's terrible. <laughs> my grandpa used to do that. That's terrible. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, well, well, getting old. Yeah. And so the change data capture, um, so I'll start off with this and let's see. So you don't do any unique demos anymore? Because you, you can't, you, there's no way you meet up on us? No, you meet up on us. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I'm gonna check to see if change data capture is enabled on any database, and unfortunately not. Okay, so actually it's fortunate I didn't leave it in a bad state, so, so I've done that, so just show you that I could do that. So I'm gonna make sure that I'm part of the, I know I'm part of the, the, the I'm part of the SAs or part of the sysadmin, so I'm gonna make SA the owner. But if you are not a member of that DBO, I wouldn't run this command and, and change the owner on a system you have no idea about. No, don't ever do that. But there's many people who forget when they restore a database from another system to change that owner. And so I put this in here just to keep track of the fact that I restored this AdventureWorks database and it wasn't set to SA as the owner. I, I put it on here because you may do that and I find some places that leave it that way. And they've had an owner that created it because when you're less than the DBO on a database and you restore it, it makes you the owner. Just, just by default, so because it can't elevate you, so it just makes you the owner, which really confuses things later on down the line. So, just well, they know who to blame. That's the bad yeah, that's part. the other thing. You know, it's you, <laughs> right? So, just remember those kind of things, and it sometimes keeps the owner that was initially set up, which may confuse things because it may not be a login you have anymore, right? All right, so disable it just to make sure that it wasn't there. Of course, it tells me, what are you doing, dummy? You, you're not, you just looked. Okay, what? I'm gonna just make sure it's on the DB as well. And I'm on the master, that's why. Let me go here. Okay, I'm gonna enable it on the DB. Okay. And I'm gonna enable it on this table and then look to see if I enabled it. Okay, now, notice two things that showed up here. Two jobs, okay? And these are essential for change data capture, okay? You must have your SQL Server agent running, or it won't start the jobs for you automatically. And it'll create them. That's the one thing about nice about agent. You can create agent jobs without the agent running because it's just running SQL to maintain a table. 
but it won't run the service for you. So you may not have the service running when you first look. So when I go back to this database server, I should find, let me do one thing too. I better turn off the change tracking here so I don't have anything running there. Um, so if I go back, look at the agent, and I didn't show prove to you before that it wasn't there, but it wasn't there, right? Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. Trust Good me. Demo. Trust me. These were not there. Actually, what I really wanted to do was to turn off my agent and to show to you that it would still create the jobs. It would just tell you that it was unable to start. Okay. So if you do that, just start both jobs. Okay. They should start automatically when the agent starts. That's basically how they're set up, but just make sure they are, right? So these jobs are set up that way. Um, another thing that you will notice is that I have no information that change data capture is running anywhere in the GUI. It's not telling me anywhere in there. It's just, it doesn't have that feature, which I wish it would. It wouldn't take that much to say, at least at the database level, that we have change data capture. I'm not sure why. The uh, change tracking page? Nope, that's, nope. Just, <laughs> that's just for change tracking, and that's okay. only change tracking. So if I probably have to, did I turn that off? Yeah, I did. I did, right? Yes. So if I refresh that, I should see that change right. tracking is on it. Yeah, it's off, right? So just so you're aware, you don't see that. So the only way you really can know is look at your jobs, see if change data capture is there as the, as the jobs. You'll see them that way. You will also notice under... Consequently, it puts the name in the yeah. jobs to us. Kind of like yeah, that. so this way, if I go in... Here, I've got these as well. We have system tables that show up. I don't know if you know much about system tables. You don't have any in 2017 anymore, really, right? If you go in here, there's nothing in here. I can show you here that if I go into tables, system tables, what do I get? Zip, Zip nada. What happened? They pushed everything to a view, right? Everything is a view now, and you don't have access truly to the tables on any in systems. Just so you, I don't know if you guys are aware of that. It's just something that has been kind of done and no one knows. So if you true? ever do a query that had the old table names, you thought they were tables? You need to use the views. They're now views. When, yeah. Yeah. When, when did they switch that? I'm not sure. I think it was 2016. Was 14 or 16, I think yeah. part, partially in 14. Yeah. And then in 16, I think the fish off and they just said to, so to use the DMVs. To yeah, you have to DMVs or the views. the views. Yeah. But now notice that when you go to, to um, change data capture, those tables end up under systems. So they haven't moved those to views, which is kind of interesting. I think it's kind of like, what? Why didn't you just switch that over too? But they didn't do that. So this is their information to track all the stuff that's going on. And they also have this table, which is the name of the table you have with change tracking. So, so just like I would set up audit tables. Yeah. <laughs> and so this tells you the start LSN, the end LSN. That's because it might happen during a batch and there might be other processes happening. So there's a start and then. No, actually, the end is never put in. This is one of those, again, that they didn't use. It's kind of a stupid one. So if we go in here, we should see nothing in there right now. Yeah, so nothing is in there. If we go in here and, oh, I wanted to show you this too. Um, let's look for, we've looked for, change data capture, we know where it is. But I also want you to know, how, I didn't have my jobs, I, I didn't want to have my agent started. 
And people now go, where is my SQL Server configuration manager? It doesn't exist anymore, really. You can't find it, right? It's not there. You have to use this command and it's specific to the version of SQL Server you're using, too. So that's actually your configuration manager now. It's I think in some instances. It's supposed to be it's supposed to be put <coughs> it's supposed to be put into the standard, what do they call it, the management yeah, computer. plugin. When you go to manage your computer, yeah. I think it shows yeah. that up in So if there. I go window E and then you can pull them. Yeah. <coughs> oh, I mustn't have hit it right. What did I do? There it is. And that'll bring up the management council, just so you're aware. There's a lot of people who get, and you'll see it, where did it go? Where did your configuration manager? So if I wanted to make sure that my, my um, SQL agent was running all the time, I would come in here, go to the properties, and configure it to run all the time. And mm -hmm. start always. Right? And what account I'd use. Also, this is the place you'd come if you wanted to assign an IP and a... Um, an actual, I'm thinking of, not the IP, but the the port that you want SQL Server to run under too. And you can assign, I don't know if you know this, but you can assign SQL Server to run on a card, on a specific port on your card, one of your cards. So and that's, that's, there's a level of security in doing that. If you can get away from 1420, is that it? 1433. 1433, which is a good thing. Try not to default it, but that means everyone has to know your port number too. Well, but it gives you another layer of security. Browser won't see it. Yeah. Nobody can just port scan. Right. Right. Typically. Yeah, you can hide it a lot easier. Okay. But that that you'll done. You'll be doing under network configuration. So of your SQL Server. Yeah, no. All right. But this is how you start it up. So don't don't think you don't have it anymore. But I thought I'd put this in here. I'll send these out too, so that you have this. So for 2000 for 2016 you have to put a 13 in here and it, it's just annoying but this is how they're doing it now um, so just a note for everybody if you don't mind my adding Tom. no no you can't add things shut up <laughs> <laughs> well that was easy <laughs> go ahead go ahead so uh just to let everybody know um i did know and there's a, a i think a white paper on it um in sql server you're not supposed to change the services themselves but we're supposed to go to service manager to make the port changes and things like that. Because anytime you do an update or upgrade that goes through the normal patching, um, it will actually destroy your settings that are set up in the services themselves. So that, that was a white paper a while back, and I don't know how long it holds up. It's just like setting some flags on, uh, on startup to get certain things running right. Okay. Just yeah, that. yeah, you're any of those things that are put in there. So I'm gonna look again at Tom and Thomas's. As you know, I switched them back. Now most of them are Tom's, and I think five or six of them are Thomas's. So that, that's actually how the database first look, is this way. So I'm just gonna run that. Is Mr. Doubting there? What's that? Is Mr. Doubting there? I don't know. Doubting Thomas? No, and, and uh, not going to be. <laughs> so I'm gonna switch them out. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and look for my LSNs. Oh, that would be fun, huh? I just want to let you know. So these are my wonderful LSNs. They're wonderful to deal with, right? They're sequential, yes. but they're not pretty. And you don't ever want to be missing one in your backups. Right. So this is, this is important and it's actually the log number. So it's actually the sequential log number. So if you actually wanted to go through the log and you wanted to read the log, this would be the number for those log entries. Okay, so that was the max and the, the begin and the end. So I'm gonna run all this to this point to see what all my changes are. 24 digit hex number. Yeah. So I'm gonna get all this out. I get their, um, the start, I, the start LSN, the whatever that is, and then I'm just getting the information as to all the changes that took place. Okay. Then I'm going to look here. 
just to show you that that actually contains the changes. There they are. So that's going to be specific to every table you change. So, so each there's going to be a table CDC with the name of the table schema underscore the name of the table underscore CT, which makes no sense. It should be CDC. Right. Right. It makes no sense that they called it change tracking when they have something else called change tracking. Well, that's Microsoft. They tend to overload names all the time, right? Data flow, that's one of them. Pipeline. What's that? Pipelines everywhere. Yeah, pipelines. Yeah, yeah. pipelines everywhere. Data flow, now they got data flow in, in, in ADF. They've got data flow inside Power BI. What? And they got data flow inside SSIS. Yeah. yeah. What the heck? Stop it. <laughs> uh, so um, to look at the LSN, um, the operations, and you can see there's the operation code there. The operation codes go one for delete, two for insert, three for updated row before the change, and four for updated after the change. Okay. So anything else there? So that's basically how you work with with the change data capture. Okay. Does the bitmask identify what? Yes, we're it actually to change identifies. It's a bitmask, an additive bitmask for the for all the columns that have changed in there. So if you want to play around with this, you can actually figure out which columns have changed as well. This is telling me that whatever this column is, it's probably I don't know where um, first name was, but whatever that that hex number for that column number was. So it probably would all be the same. Yeah, I'm, I'm betting that's what, 16, right? Isn't that 16? So the 16th column was changed. And so you, they, they do an, or it might be a, or, oh yeah, it could be the sum of, I don't know. It could be base two. Actually. Yeah, I'm not sure how it works, so. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the change data capture piece. Um, so, to compare the two together so far, we've got change tracking, all versions, tracks only data change, synchronous, part of a transaction, so that means it has a, an effect on your system. Um, you use only the change table, that's how you get at it. So all the changes go through the change table. It's a function, essentially. Um, and it maintains the version. You have to maintain the versions of. So when you want to track this, you maintain the version you last ran. Right? So that's how you keep track of that. Whereas in this one, you maintain it with the LSMs. Okay? So this one's enterprise, so it's a cheap option. Right? Right? Um, I don't know. Uh, as for arrays or as for CDC, right? Yeah. Um, I, I personally think that, you know, Temporal tables may be the answer for most people nowadays anyway. So that's why I'm talking about that. And you go, am I going to seven already? Yeah. Holy crap, boss. I gotta hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> you can go over. What's that? You can go over, it's okay. Okay. Um, so if I would have talked about the data warehousing part, we'd be here till like nine. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that. It's all in good fun. Yeah. All right, um, and it's asynchronous and it tracks all the changes. And you actually have all the changes in this one. That's the benefit of change data capture. You've got all the changes. This one, it's asynchronous, log reader, but that does limit you. There are some limitations on implementing replication with CDC. Um, and so you have to be concerned about that. All right. Now, temporal tables are system versioned, okay? This is actually part, and this is how it works. You basically have your temporal table, which is weird, it's your table, right? I'll call it a temporal table just because it's gonna contain this as well, which is a history table. But your table still is, is a table, it's just to make it temporal, you have to make a little bit of changes to it, okay? And then all the old versions go over here. That's how it works. So you're, just like any other table, you're, Data looks like your data here. Whatever you did to it, it's here. But anything you, it was before will be here. All right. Um, it was available in 2016. Um, it actually is part of ANSI standard. 
So it wasn't something Microsoft came up on their own. It's actually a standard, and they actually followed it, <laughs> which for Microsoft is amazing. So, um, so you should be able to use the same features in anyone else who's implemented temporal tables. So Oracle's temporal tables should work the same way. All right, um, which is weird because that hasn't happened. Microsoft is starting to follow the standard. Remember when XML first came out? Microsoft did it their own way. And got all that. that was terrible. Um, well, SQL Server servers have Linux now too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Um, it's awesome for auditing. That's probably one of the main reasons you would do this. Is you get some features here that are awesome. You see this little lock here? That's important. CDC, I can do things. I can get rid of things. I can go into that CDC table that you just saw me in. Wipe them I can wipe them all out. Okay, here I really can't do anything to this table. Once I implement the temporal table, what about like archiving uh, or purging? That you'll have to do it in a special way, and that's all up to you. And that is turning it off, turning it back on again. Reboot. Yeah, so you turn it off, do what you need to do, turn it back on. So release the locks and you can do them again. So yeah, and so that way you can get to that. So that because when you turn it off, it doesn't actually do delete this. It actually moves it. And it's kind of interesting. It, when you first look at it, it looks like it's under the database. But then when you remove system versioning, it moves it into a separate table like a normal table. Should I take it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so, no. Um, and it's also for rebuilding corruption or problems as well. Um, and you also, it's really good for projecting analysis. So you're tracking all the changes in your data. So imagine a warehouse system where it's only done in the transactional processing system. You don't know what happened to your inventory one went to next. You just know that right now the inventory is this. <coughs> but you don't know when the inventory changed. And so using this, you can actually track those trends in an easy way. Yeah, I wouldn't do it in CDC because that's a difficult piece of look to do it with. I mean, you could do it. It's just you got to run that stupid code. This one, you just run it against a table just like you would any other table. And there's a, there's a combining code that we can use as well. Okay, um, creating temporal tables requires a primary key. This is a big case for some databases. I have a database, I wanted to implement table t temporal and I can't find the primary keys on the table because the source of it, I don't know what they are. I really can't figure out what the primary key is. So I can't implement it. It has about 13 ID fields and I don't know which one. So, this is a big one. Um, you have to add three columns. These three columns get added to the table. One is your valid from or your start. You name it whatever you want. This is your own name. Okay? Oh, I just pressed on the screen. That was brutal. <laughs> Don't do that again. <laughs> Whose screen is this? Okay. Um, you basically um, name that what you want. It has to be date time two. Has to be. Has to be. Has to be. All right? Then you use these wonderful terms, and this is actually going to be a cross. If you looked in Oracle, they would have the same terminology. That's the way it was implemented. Okay? So you do this. Can't be null. The next one you do is two. Okay? That also you say is the end. Then, by defining this, this special column called period, you basically let the system maintain the from and to for you. That's what it does. So because you define these this way, it automatically uses for system time with this, with this feature, automatically maintains this. So that means it terminates the record for you with the correct time, and it adds the new starting date for you, always on these columns. So that's always cool. I don't have to create a trigger for that myself, right? 
Um, and then you would add the with system versioning on, and then you would name the table you want to call it. Okay? So that's this. And usually people have done things like schema underscore call, name, name of the table underscore history, or something like that. Or if they want to call it history, put it in the history schema, that's fine too. So you could easily just put it in the history schema and do it that way. So it doesn't have to be DBO? No. In fact, I, that was a mistake. Yeah. Nice catch on that. I, yeah. I did that on purpose so. to see if anyone would catch it. <laughs> yeah. That you mean should, I win the free that trip? Be, yeah. Yeah. You get the trip to, yeah. yeah, you get the trip to Seattle. No. Oh, no. darn. <laughs> to Fond du Lac. To, oh, <laughs> what a deal. Fond du Lac, that's it. OK. Um, now, to do it on an existing table, so what I just showed you, you put on a new table, okay? Now, because it has a not null requirement, you have to fill in defaults. So that means when you alter a table, you have to add the three columns, but with defaults, okay? Um, and then make sure that the end is the max value for the data type. Really important, it's kind of funny, that end date time for Date time two is 999. End of time. 12, 31, 23, 59, um, 59. and 99999. I think it's like seven or eight. Wow. Nine. And if you don't do that exactly, it won't work. Oh, no way. Yes. It, it's amazing. Okay? So we have to do this. That's on even an Oracle? Probably an Oracle. I don't know what their data type is. That's the only problem. I don't know what their date time that they have to implement for it's their convert. Okay. No matter. Because of course SQL has their own date time, they have their own times. So I don't know what they are. Okay, so that's important that you throw in this default. Okay, and it has to be exactly this. All right. Um, also, name your freaking default. Absolutely. <laughs> Because when you want to remove this and you oh, haven't named every fault, here. you're going to be like, oh, crap, i got to go get that name and, and remove the default. Okay? Because you can't do anything to a table unless you remove the default first, right? Can't do that. So, um, so let's demo this. All righty. That's a lot of sitting on it, standing. Didn't think about that when I said I was going to do this today. What the heck? What am I thinking? I thought it was only going to take an hour. Damn. You're in good company. Good. All right. So now I'm going to go to my temporal code. And I am actually, let me get rid of my CDC first. Enabled, wasn't it? Did I get rid of it? That's weird. Okay, just to make sure. Nothing there. Okay. And I should have my jobs gone. Yeah. So that's 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 important to check that. Make sure you got everything cleaned up. All right. Um dually change tracking. Right. So I'm going to clean up my, no, I didn't want this right. Yeah, let me do all this. I don't want to show you what I just did. But. Person by person. I think that that's not there. This one, I, I need to keep that one. My 
probably hide that somewhere else. Darn it. So, I'm going to go through this process now that I start here. Okay. So, the first thing I do is I go ahead and I add the columns that I said you need to add. And what were they? Something from, something to, and a period. Okay. And then I identify how I want to... Um, how I want to save the history table. What, what name do I put to it? So I go ahead and I said, I'm going to take the person table, go ahead and version it. And then when I do so, and I refresh this, you will notice that something funny happened here. Can you see that? Windows oh, darn it. You see it here every time I hit the magnifier, it's going to be like Windows Plus. There it is. You see it? Okay. Now I've got the table with its columns. And this is kind of confusing because you go, oh, I'll click on this one because that's where I normally click for columns. No, that's not where you click. That's going to give you the history table. This is the columns for the table I created or that I updated. And notice you don't see period in there. And you never will. Okay. It's just not going to be something you see. It's actually a system reserved column that's maintained internally. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are my to and from. Um, I so if I go and look at all the data right now, should have my valid to and from and they're made from my default that I put it okay they're all sitting there all right now to do it for a new table if I want to create a new table did I delete that table with the claim in here no okay so for a new table I'm going to create it this way without the default okay so I'm going to create a new table I'm going to put on a primary key one of the requirements. Remember, it had to be a primary key. And I go ahead and I say execute. And I should see my claim table show up. And there it is, system versioned. OK. Notice I threw in a different word here, hidden. That's a reserve where you can actually use it wherever you want to. If you don't want a column available when someone does a select star, you can, you can put in hidden. And so that's when you create it if you want to. Will so, it also hide it from the object explorer? No, it does not. Okay. That's the catch. So watch when I do this. So when I did, I don't know if you noticed that, but when I did select here, it's there, okay? So it doesn't exclude it from there, but when I do this, it's not there. So it's only on the select star that it's hidden from. So you still see it, and you, you'll know it's there if you're a DBA and you have that, you have the rights to see things. What, what about if you're just writing a query and you give a table an alias, and type the alias dot, will you see the no, anytime you do the dot for the, anything for that table, if you've defined the column as hidden, it will not be a show up in a star anytime, even if you alias it, whatever. It'll know it'll there. So that means if you wanted to use it in a join condition, yes, that would work. Okay? Okay. Uh, what, what I meant was not the uh, alias dot star, but alias dot, and then you see the list of fields. 
that you can pick from. I, oh, I don't know. Oh, you meant so if you oh, do you select yeah. plain dot, yeah. will it show up in the list? Yeah, it's yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. But this is, yeah. Was that like Red Was Gate. that SQL's prompt or was that? It looks like Redgate product. That was SQL prompt. That was SQL prompt. prompt. Yeah. That, that's actually SQL prompt. So it might be different if you used something else. I don't IntelliSense, know. Sure. If you just use native. IntelliSense. IntelliSense may not do it. I'm not sure. So. Well, he, I didn't look into that. He did put a claim down about it, though. Yeah. So, all right. Now, um, I'm going to turn this one off just to make sure it's off. This is the point on this. Oh, this is the point on this one. So I'm going to create this, this temporal table, but notice the one thing I didn't do is at the end is name the table. Right? Oh, so what oh. happens then? Oh, yeah. Is there an error? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I <laughs> sorry no two. I get an error because I didn't delete this table. Okay. Okay. To give you a default table name. Yeah, that's what I'm going to show you. Oh, that sucks. So, uh, let me come in here. Look at that wonderful name. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Temporary history oh. for yeah for a long number. And nice, beautiful, isn't it? One That's what you want to do. Always use the defaults yep. in Microsoft because <laughs> they they treat you so nice. I still wish that when you create a subscription that we could name the subscription. Yeah, I in know. SSRS. Mm -hmm. God, I hate that. that Going to look for the job. Oh, painful. Terrible, painful. But this that's still one that sucks. But this is what you get. Can you rename it? I wouldn't. Destroy it. Start over. <laughs> it's locked. No error message or anything. No error messages? No, nothing. It's history. It's history. It, here's, and, and this is the nice thing about it is you can't change it. <laughs> so just, just don't do this. Put a name in there. Yeah. Just... Just, just wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and change these again. Just care about your job. <laughs> and go ahead and uh, just select from the history table at the end. And so that's the history table. Other things I want to show you on this, on this table here, you'll notice that in the history table, I have no keys. No keys at all. Oh. All right. The keys are gone. I can have defaults, I believe, can stay on there. But they normally don't go when you switch them over. Once, If you have the default on the base table, I don't believe it will actually take the default over. But the one thing it does do is adds a clustered normal, um, not column store, but a um, row store um, index. On and this will surprise you. All the columns. It's on the two in the front. Oh no way. Okay. So that and it's just Oh, because it is clustered that way it would have the data anyway. So yeah. So it has it in this order. So it's ease for you know for for viewing. Because you're gonna look for it by history, right? You're not gonna sure. look at any other way. So that, that's what it throws on, no indexes. Just remember this and this are blob and the blob fields. That's a lot of data There's to keep in history. So think about that when you're creating a history table, that you may be storing a lot of data twice or three or five or 700 times. Can you eliminate some yeah. of those, Carl? No, that's the other thing is you can't go in here and change any of the data. So this is what's so awesome about this as an audit tool. You can't change the data. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Okay. Um, but the way to go ahead and view this data without having to go to that separate history table is to use the for system commands. Okay. 
the four system commands allow you to select from your table using the four system to use either between, between, contained in, or all, and there's a couple other ones. But you can then say, I want to look at, at a certain, and I, I won't, let me just grab one of these. Copy. It's per. Look at an earlier one. This one. Copy. I think it's inclusive, so I think that actually will grab one. So that will give me those. Okay? And those are whatever they're 2000 and 20,077. So we go ahead, or we can do this for a date range that we want. And that'll give us whatever fits in that date range. Since it, today is the um, the first, this seems to fit all the records that we've changed. Okay. And notice that the to and froms are all the records, so it's just going to be able to pick that. Oh, I did star, and then I also put it in the battle of two. So that's why you see the battle of two twice. Oh. Sorry, shouldn't have done that. But if you want all of them, you just grab with the all. You may have touched on this before, but um, when you update a row, since it is a, a you know table snapshot type history system, will it copy the entire table at that point back to the history table, or is it just going to take row by row when you when you change it? So, what was the first part of that? Like, say you updated your first row, right? Will it only copy that back to your history table for that row, or yeah, will it take only a whole for that snapshot? row. That okay, good. That row. Okay. It only changes the history of what would look like before. So, so it grabs record. what it looked like just before it was changed. On record. Yeah, and that's it. So if you want what it looks like right now, where do you go? For the table, just like you did any other time. But if you want the changes, you include the four system time, or you can actually go to that history table if you want to. Okay? I don't see a reason for doing that. You can grab this four system time to do whatever you need to do. So we'll have a copy of the current? Yep, in the database, in the table as it right. is. And then all the other versions of that record. Besides the current. And not the current won't be in there. History will not contain, not the, current. contain the current. So okay. the current, you know, um, it's, it's awesome for auditing. By default, the other thing that I want to say is we have the consistency checks. We have schema checks when we create it. And what it does for schema checks is it looks to see that the temporal history the temporal table and the history table are, have consistent metadata. Oh, wow. Okay? Um, it checks to make sure that the, the period columns are not null. It checks to see that you have a PK. So when you create this and you say, okay, I got an error, these are the things you look to see what you've screwed up on when you create it. No, no triggers, constraints, or foreign keys are allowed on the history. Um, for the data, all it does is it maintains that there's a consistency check between the data and the two, and it also makes sure that there's no overlapping time span of data. Okay, so that's why that system thing, we're looking for the data type, is so careful. It wants to make sure you put the last possible day and time on that record because of the overlap possibility, okay? Um, the query temporal tables, um, they, so the temporal table itself contains the present state, all the histories, all the other transactional states. That's important to remember, it's transactional states. So if you, in, within a transaction, did four changes on that data and is stuck within one transaction, you will only see the last state. Right? You won't see all the intermediate things. It'll put in what you had, and the, it'll put in the change that you eventually end up in the temporal table, and then the very first state that that record was in before that transaction took place into the history. Would Not the intermediates in that step. CDC, unless you marked it as separate transactions within. CDC would have them all, though. No. CDC would also go by transactions, I believe. Oh, is that as a Yeah. 
I think that there's no way around that because of the way transactions are handled also in the log file. I would think it's because of the way it was supposed to be implemented. That's why I asked the question about yeah. CDC. Yeah. Because I've actually had to fix logs. Yeah. Don't ever try it. It's no. not recommended. No. Um, and these are the clauses you can use. So you can use as of, so what and date time. You can use from, to, between, and, and contained in and all. Okay, we did that already. Um, consideration for temporal, you require a PD, uh, primary key. You have to use a date time two. It always has chain page compression on the history table. So they're not going to be over bloated. It's going to have at least some compression on it. Even if you don't have compression on the on the, the temporal table to itself, it'll add compression on the on the history for you. That can actually improve performance on it could actually improve too. performance. Yeah, yeah. But you want to improve it more? Put compression on your, your base table, right? Um, no constraints on the history table. The history um, cannot be modified directly, and the system time periods in the base table can't be modified directly in any queries as well. So your temporal table, you can't say, hey, I want the valid two to be this. No, it won't let you modify those two columns as well. No truncation allowed anywhere. Anywhere. Drop table. The only way you can do it is take it off. Okay, um, use of triggers and replication are limited. Although, here's the nice thing you can't really see is this one, you can't see any, I think this might be refreshed. Um, this is the same trigger as before. Yeah. This is the same. Not for replication. Maybe. Yeah. So, don't, it, it uses triggers internally and you can't, and a lot of them you can't see too. So be sure, don't use your own triggers mm, on these tables. Yeah, thanks okay. for warning. And then the last thing is, is before I'm done, DMVs is do not change your system time. <laughs> I wondered about that right away. System yeah. time. Do not change your system. Do not go on your server and say, oh, it's actually, no, don't do that. <laughs> system, time is, system time is always UTC. Yeah, it's always, oh, that's an important thing I wanted yes. to bring up too, sorry. If, I don't know if you noticed that, but it's actually tomorrow in all those records that I updated. It's not today. Sorry. Because it's UTC. Okay. And so a useful thing, uh, I think I talked, yeah, time zone. You can use at time zone command when you use selecting a, selecting a date time that's UTC and you can say time zone at time zone central standard time to get it to convert for you because it's always UTC. Um, pointed time analysis, that's what PIT stands for. So if you want to do point now, point in time, you can use temporal tables very easily. It's a nice feature to use it in. Um, so you can look at things like, okay, pen anywhere? Uh, you have a marker? Yep. Is this a dry erase here? Yeah. Oh, it is? Yep. Okay. So you can do like analysis in which you're looking at inventory, the number of inventory items you have per day or per time frame very easily. So inventory is a great place to do this, and so you can look at that. Another thing you could do is look for anomalies, something like that, to come up easily as well with temporal tables. So don't. So you can look at outlier detections as well to look what's happening to your data and when did you see something funky happen? Oh, all this data was changed this day at this time by this person who is <laughs> under audit by the FCC. <laughs> so. Who's driving expensive cars. Yeah. Um, it slowly changing dimensions, awesome place for using temporal tables. Um, you have all the changes. You can identify their start and end date. You don't have to do a lot of logic yourself, which is really awesome. I mean, just doing that logic and ending the previous record, you don't have to worry about that. It's there. Okay, 
So the ending and the starting of the Earth record is there for you. And you get all the changes. So if it's important for some auditing and some history, you have all the changes. So you can do a slowly changing dimension for each change during that time of day. Okay. Would this be good for uh, some implementations of like a data vault model then? Since yeah, you're... actually this could replace data vault, data vault in a really good sense. Okay. Because your history is there. Right. The place, if you want to do it in one database, this is awesome. But if you have multiple databases and multiple different sources, data vault's your only answer for tracking yeah. multiple right. changes and tracking changes in multiple systems. Okay. Right. Excellent. Yeah, it's, but this is awesome for one system. You wouldn't even need data vault because you never use data vault for one database that you're looking at. It makes no sense almost. It's when you have multiple sources that you say, hey, I got to look to see how these sources are changing and, and maintaining those changes across systems. Mm -hmm. um, but it's secure by design. The history tables can't be dropped. The schema can't be altered directly. The, you, the read access is not automatically given to someone who has, if you gave individual read access to tables, instead of saying data reader, if you did data reader, they could see this table. That's oh. not an issue. But if you say they have read access to the temporal table, they are not by default given read access to the history. Okay. Um, comparison, and I um, just temporal is synchronous. So it does have a performance hit. Okay. Um, temporal is done at a table level and only at a table level. You create a table, you alter a table. It has all historical, so just like CDC. And no changes in code are required. So when you want to go ahead and read from that table and get the history, you can just get it. You don't have to change anything. Whereas for CDC, you have to go and say, oh, this is the view I want to, this is the function I want to use to read the change, change data capture stuff. Um, and I can just go in and write a query to simply do that. Um, you can truncate the history in CDC. Um, you can't in in temporal, um, you can do data trends and secure history, and CDC requires an agent. So these are the kind of the differences here. And then I'm done. Sorry, <laughs> took so long. <laughs> oh, awesome. So let's just talk about implementing change data, um, slowly changing dimensions now. No, just